Good evening, everybody. Um, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to Health Innovation One. My name is Jo Rycroft Malone, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Health and Medicine, and this is our wonderful um, new home. For the obvious reasons, we haven't spent a lot of time in this wonderful new home since it's been open um, from the middle of eight, uh, last year. And in fact, this is the only, the second event that we've had in this building like this. Now, we, in the meantime, of course, we've been training our medical school students and we've been carrying on with our research, but it's absolutely wonderful that we can host this event in this building because um, not only is this the home for the faculty, it's also a, a space for interaction, for discussion, for um, interdisciplinary working. So it's, it's extremely relevant that we find ourselves here with the title of this evening's um, session where we're bringing different perspectives together on this particular issue. So it's great to see you all here. A very warm welcome to Health Innovation One and I'm going to pass you over to my colleague Simon Guy who's going to welcome you to the event. Thank you Joe. yes and yeah welcome to tonight's event. Uh, it is the concluding event of our COP26 festival. Uh, and we're delighted that we're able to do this in association with Michael and the Ecopod, which I hope many of you have had the chance uh, to experience, as unpleasant as it is, though, though strangely beautiful to look at. Um, and that's really here to kind of catalyze a conversation um, around uh, air quality and the environment and the climate emergency, which is really what the festival is all, around, all about. So, uh, as I say, my name's Simon Guy. I'm one of the Pro Vice Chancellors here, and I'm our kind of institutional lead on sustainability. So it's my responsibility working across the university to try and meet our obligations, which are very significant. Last November, we uh, declared formally the climate emergency, and with the support of our council, which really formalizes things for us, um, we committed to being carbon neutral by 2035, which is a very, very significant kind of ambition. Um, and we're now busy working through our plans uh, to advance that, that plan. And the COP26 festival is an important part of that. Um, because in advance of thinking what we should do about COP, um, we are engaged with the actual COP itself, and we have kind of our leading researchers working in that. But we thought it was very important to have a more inclusive event where we brought together colleagues, staff, students, and the community uh, that we're part of to come together in conversation around the challenge of the climate emergency, which is one for governments and the council and the university and big businesses, but it's also an issue for all of us as individuals and as families as well. So it seems absolutely key that we come together in kind of conversation to try and better understand what the challenge is and to try and better identify what we can all do individually and collectively. And this evening's conversation is really all about that. So uh, we've got a, a great panel. We've got a brilliant audience. So I'm really looking forward to um, a really engaging conversation. And to tell you how it's going to work, I'm going to pass on again to my colleague, Jocelyn Cunningham. Jocelyn. Is this on? Yes, it is. It's one of those things. Is this on? Can you hear me? I'm Jocelyn. I'm director of Lancaster Arts, and it's fantastic to have so many of you in the room. I don't know if you're feeling what some of the speakers and I are feeling. It's just odd to be in a room together, masked up, having a conversation that is just so important. And partly because of that, we wanted this to be a relaxed event. You can see that the seating is in a particular way to enable social distancing. But we've got fantastic, I don't know if you've seen the COP26 biscuits, they're not vegan. There's vegan cake downstairs. But what we want is an event where you feel able to have a cup of tea, have a fill up. It's not formal. We want interaction. We are all experts in this subject area. We all breathe. We've all experienced air pollution. So what we've done is we've pulled together a broad range of speakers, each coming with a particularly different perspective. And uh, each of our speakers are going to speak for between five and 10 minutes. And then at the end of each little moment from the speakers, we're going to ask them to come up with a question for everyone that's in the room. And Richard, <laughs> My assistant here is going to be writing up the questions and he's also going to be microphone man because this is a, a long room, isn't it? We want to be sure we can hear everyone and I know that we also have some children in the room, which is fantastic. So before, when you have an urgent need to speak, if you could just wave your arm and Richard will make sure that you have the chance to have the microphone. 
Um, so we'll hear from speakers, then we'll hear all together. As Simon says, this is a conversation first. It's not a formal panel. Um, so when this is over, which is around uh, 7.45, we have um, a cellist that some of you may know because she lives here in Lancaster, Maya Buga. And Maya comes from Norway, which has the cleanest air in the world, I'm told. Uh, and she has composed music uh, to Michael Pinsky's pod. So it's, it's a world premiere, original music to the pod of the future. If you haven't had a chance to go into the pod, we have very, very few places left. The pod has to be dismantled this evening at quarter to nine because it's racing over to Newcastle. So the pod's been in London, Birmingham, Lancaster, Newcastle, and then Michael will tell you more, but it will end up in Glasgow for, for the conference next week. Um, we have filming taking place, and we have uh, a photo two photographers, I think, in the room. Um, if there is at any point um, you're not happy having your photograph taken, just let the photographer know, and we'll make sure it's not used. If you want to social media anything, you will see on the green banner here a hashtag pollution drift. So obviously we can only have so many people in this room, and that is a wonderful way of bringing more voices into this conversation. Um, and lastly, I guess you'd expect me to say this as um, Director of Lancaster Arts, but I am genuinely thankful that we have an opportunity here at the university to show how an artwork can make a difference in a subject like this. Um, so often the arts is seen as decoration or something on the side, and I think Michael's work will really show how this is a central way of making a difference to people's hearts and minds. And it's also, well, Michael will say more, but I think arts gives us an opportunity to think differently and see things differently. So I'm really, really pleased that you've come to hear a conversation about arts, health equity, and air pollution. Thank you for coming. So over to you, Michael. I'll leave you to introduce yourself. Uh, yeah. And oh, you. Hi there. Um, well, welcome to uh, the pollution pod of the future um, downstairs. Um, it's great to be invited here tonight. We've got a, like a really fast journey up the country because we've got to keep up with these cycling doctors. So there's this bunch of 70 doctors or medical professionals, to be accurate, who have left Great Ormond Street on bikes. Some of the less fit ones have electric bikes, I have to say. But. And they're cycling up, and at each point we have to take down the pod and put it up and kind of keep ahead of the race, so to speak. And they're arriving in Glasgow on, in, on Sunday at lunchtime, so we have to have all five pods up in Glasgow then. So um, there's one team setting them up in Glasgow while we set them up here. Um, so it's been quite an exciting race, um, tomorrow's going to be incredibly difficult. We've got to get them up by 2 o'clock, and we're not even in Newcastle, so that doesn't really help. Um, so, um, I mean, where, where I come from is probably... I mean, I've always done work that's... I've always been interested in changing uh, kind of social aspects of being together, and early work that I did was very much about transportation. Um, I moved to London... I lived in the countryside in Scotland, and I moved to London. I became very interested in how people moved from saying, like if you live in the Petland Hills where I lived, you'd say, I live 10 miles away from Pennycook. You move to London, you say, I'm 20 minutes away from Leicester Square, and suddenly you move from a kind of spatial way of defining things to a temporal way of defining things. And the reason for that is basically because everywhere is a traffic jam. Um, and back in those days, I kind of thought, well, you know, I mean, this is way before Google and GPS and all of that. I thought if people really knew how long it took to, take for, to get from A to B, then they wouldn't get in a car, they would walk or cycle. And so I started making up mapping systems like that so people could visit and look at the maps and change the way they move around London. And then, of course, like, Google caught up with that and <laughs> the, rest is, the rest is history. But um, I kind of moved through that, um, having always been interested in the environment, to starting to make work directly about climate change um, and did pieces in the mid 
2000s that looked at flooding, for example, where I cut cars in half and stuck them in the Tyne for the World Summit of Arts and Culture in Newcastle. And now I look at these pictures that have come out this year, and I think they, are, they look a lot more effective than my sculpture in the Tyne. I've got to say, the cars were all over the place. Um, but after doing work like that for almost a decade, I realised that it did attract attention, but it didn't really engage with people's everyday lives. And it was only when I started working with these environmental psychologists in Norway did I start having a really kind of deep conversation about what kind of work can really impact on people and change their behaviour patterns. And that made me think, well, you know, the old kind of polar bear on a glacier or cracking deserts and things like that, that's, that seems too remote uh, to people. Even though I've got to say, like, this year, everything's changed round. I mean, what seemed remote, you know, now we have these huge floods in Germany, we have forest fires all over the place. It's starting to feel much more immediate. But back then, even a few years ago, it didn't. Um, so that moved me into thinking about, well... Air pollution isn't the cause of climate change, but the cause of air pollution and the causes of climate change overlap enormously. And so maybe that's a way to engage people. Um, and it's it, it, this idea of having an experience that's entirely bodily and visceral rather than an intellectual experience was also very important. And that was something that came out very much in these discussions with the environmental psychologists, was that data does not change behaviour. We have the data, we have the science, but you don't change behaviour through data, you change it by changing the culture. And then that is where the responsibility falls back on people who work with culture. So I think one of the best examples of this is with smoking, where in a, a really rapid period of time, it became... I mean, we knew for decades that it gave you cancer, but there was just a certain point where it became culturally unacceptable to smoke. I mean, we wouldn't have had to have gone that far back, and we'd be sitting here, and one or two of us would be having a cigarette, and a bunch of you would be having cigarettes, and that would be kind of normal. And now, if one of you lit up a cigarette here, it would be pretty shocking, and probably a smoke alarm would go off. Um, so that's, a, you know, so these changes can happen really, really fast. But it's through changing the culture, not through pushing the data out all the time. <coughs> it's somehow, socially and together, it has to become unacceptable to have certain types of behaviour. And one of the things that is my personal bee in the bonnet is around driving the, the private vehicle. Um, and obviously, at the moment, most of them have combustion engines. And there's this very neat shift that everyone sees now, that I'm going to shift to an electric vehicle in the next few years, and, and that's me sorted. But... The problem with that is electric vehicles still have a lot of friction on the road, they still generate large particulates, they still use an enormous amount of energy just to make, and then we have the problem with the battery technology, with the finite resources involved in battery technology. Um, now, I live in Islington, in London, and under 30% of the people who live in Islington own a car. So if I was in a room like this, there'd be maybe two or three people who put up their hands. But I guess living where you are, and maybe, but how many of you own a car? Just, yeah, like, you don't own a car because you've not, but do you want... <laughs> um, so that's actually only about half of you, I reckon, and there's a few children there, and a, a few students, I suppose. Um, but, you know, that, you know, that's a major thing that we can change personally. Um, that will make a huge impact to air pollution and also climate change. But then, of course, we're in a kind of bind there because I imagine a lot of you, and I'll ask, I mean, we might push out questions, but would say, where I live, it's impossible not to have a car. I mean, 
But then I kind of look, and then this is my experience. I, I only came, my first day in Lancaster was yesterday, right? So I get off at the railway station and I get a bus. You know, I don't get a taxi to, to here because <laughs> that's just against my principles, uh, if I can possibly avoid it. So I get a bus, very full, hard to get on that bus. There's so many students on it. And then I come up this road, the bus is diesel. Uh, I come up this road and it's a traffic jam because there's lots of cars and there's no dedicated bus lane. And I get up here and I, I get a lift with someone back. Massive traffic jam, so bad that I just say I'm going to get off and walk back into Lancaster. It's faster. And I kind of think, right, you're the pro vice chancellor and we've got a councillor here and we've got how many, peop how many students are in this university? Yeah, 14,000. 14,000. Maybe half of them live in Lancaster? Or? A lot live on campus. Right. Majority. But there's thousands who live there. So this little route back and forwards must be really heavily, heavily used. And I would think surely there's a walk around, as well as staff, that would mean that that road could be dedicated to a public transport system that was at least electric and moved all these people without it jamming up. And, and I suppose what I'm kind of coming down to here, and I'm probably way out of my 10 minutes now, but is that there's lots of good policies and there's lots of good words and intentions, but when we actually get down to the ground of the action on the ground, what's happening and the evidence of that, then that seems to be much more challenging. And that's just my experience of getting off here. And there may be many other issues, but. You know, if we're going to get people out of cars, we have to give them real options. And then how do we do that? How do we get the money there? How do we facilitate the space being there and the vehicles and things like that to really transfer that across? So my question is, to finish, because I'm sure I've done that in my 10 minutes, is if you own a vehicle, a private vehicle, what would it take for you to give it up? You know, so I'm not going to say, would you get rid of it? I'm saying, what would it take for you to get rid of it? And then that will be the key to how we can move forwards. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Could I just ask, how many of you have been inside Michael's part of the future? Most of you? I just think it might be worth a minute or two talking about the creation of the part of the future. <laughs> yeah, rather than going off on a, a bend or somewhere. Right, OK. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I mean, when I originally did these pods, I won't talk for very much longer. Um, it, in Norway, I really had no idea what I was doing. Um, so I thought I could take a kind of compressor out to India and suck in the air in New Delhi and bring it back. Um, but I was working with the Norwegian uh, University of Science and Technology and they put me in touch with engineers and they said, well, the trouble is when you compress those chemicals, they actually become other chemicals, you know, because you put them under compression and it's really dangerous and you can't release carbon monoxide in a confined space or nitric oxide and things like that. So, so then what I did was I started infusing things like water and cotton with like dirty old generators and then I burnt plastic, it's not very right on, is it? And <laughs> infused those and then wood and I started doing all of this and, and, I, and that's kind of what I used. I even like um, worked out how to get sulfuric smells from eggs and things like that. So in Norway it was complete like DIY thing. Very unpredictable, really hard to control, potentially quite dangerous. And, and then I had to show in London, um, and Norwegians are really laissez-faire about this, by the way. I don't know, if you ever go to a castle, there's none, no railings anywhere. You know, you go on the top, it's like, well, if you're going to fall off the edge, just, just don't go very near the edge. I mean, it's very much that mentality. So they're, they're really laissez-faire. But when I showed it in London for the first time, it was like, no, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. And then I had to do a, like a 250-page health and safety document, 
with course certificates and IFRA certificates and all of that. So, so what I had to do is start working with perfumers and in fact with this company called International Fra Flavors and Fragrances who have this enormous database of chemicals to recreate the pollution smell safely. And so that's what you're experiencing down there. So that's mostly a mix of combusted diesel, tar off the road and a few other extra bits and then something to control the visibility. But when I show all of them together, then I change the humidity and the heat and the visibility. So it's a very different experience as you go from one to the other. It's not just, this is quite bad, this is worse, and this is terrible. They're very, very different in the, in the type of pollution it is. So I kind of think of it as a kind of wine tasting experience, but for air pollution, um, really. When I went into that into that uh, pod, was this is the smell of perfume? I have to say, but right. um, so that's quite revelatory. Yeah. Um, so thank you, that. and you've given us a really good link actually to our next panel member who's going to speak. Uh, we're delighted to have with us Dr. Paul Young from our Lancaster Environment Centre. I mean, one of the themes, I think, of what Michael shared with us is actually the invisibility in one way of, of, of the air and the need to understand it kind of scientifically. So Paul is an atmospheric scientist, and he, he works on science problems related to air pollution. He's also our environment lead in our Institute for Social Futures, so very much thinking about that theme of uh, air pollution into the future. So Paul, thanks for being with us. Great. Thanks very much, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so I want to thank Michael, because you've covered everything <laughs> that I was going to say, and you stole my question. But it's OK. I'm going to, but this is part of the things you want to think on happy. So, um, yeah, it's actually really, really nicely set up, I think, for what I want to say. So I think so one, of, one of the things that, that Michael talked about was the invisibility um, of things like climate change. So carbon dioxide, which I think many of us know, um, is a greenhouse gas, and that's the big thing that we care about in terms of climate change. We don't really care about that so much in terms of air pollution, um, and it's also invisible. But there are some things, air pollution, sometimes we can see it, and sometimes we can taste it. So if you go down, uh, if those of you who are local, maybe go down to Morecambe Bay, if the wind is blowing this way from, uh, from the east, you can see pollution that's been piled up from other bits of the country, and you can see that sometimes as a haze when you're looking towards the Lake District. You know, so air pollution is something that we can see, and as Michael said, that air pollution has the same sources um, as, as, uh, as these gases which you care about for climate change, like CO2. So I just want to say a little bit, so, so my, 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 uh, my day job, I research uh, about what's in the atmosphere, how it might change with climate, and how the climate might change. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that, don't worry, I'm going to give you a lecture. But I want to say a little bit about you know, why we care about air pollution, where it comes from, and what we might do about it. So firstly, why we care about air pollution. So it is really bad for your health, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that later. But we have estimates. Um, that we can look at globally, about four, over four million people every year have their lives cut short through breathing uh, poor air quality. And if we um, go with the, the latest estimates of what the, what the, the World Health Organization, the UN body, what, what they think air pollution um, shouldn't exceed, about 99% of the world are at, exposed to air which is at, um, at pollution levels above that above that limit. Okay, so it's a really bad problem. It affects really all of us. Um, and one of the, uh, one of the, we have lots of children with us today, and one of the, the, the things that is, is really bad about air pollution, that can be really bad for children, is because they tend to breathe more quickly, they take in more of this air pollution, and it can really cause them a lot of harm. And you'll hear a bit more about that later. So it's pretty, pretty bad, right? So it's, uh, air pollution really is, is not good. We, pretty much, we can find air pollution in every organ in your body um, and uh, causing all, all sorts of um, nasty medical effects. Where does it come from? So transport, we've heard, of, um, heard about that with a really nice example, actually, of this A6 in front of here. I don't know, hands up if you cycle sometimes. Hands up if you feel you can taste the air. <laughs> as you're going along. Yeah, absolutely. So transport is a huge and very important source of, um, of air pollution. 
um, particles in the atmosphere, uh, but also gases, so uh, nitrous oxide, ozone, particulate matter. These are names which you may have heard of, and these are all associated uh, with um, the exhaust from transport. Um, we also uh, have it coming from, um, from industrial activity, so factories in and around here, but also uh, power stations. If they're burning coal, if they're burning gas, if they're burning biomass, basically if you're burning anything, you're going to be giving, up, giving off air pollution. And that leads me to one of the other uh, sources. Hands up if you have a wood-burning stove. I am guilty of this too, and I'm an atmospheric chemist. Huge, huge source of uh, particulate matter pollution. The source of that has grown, it's doubled over the last 20 years or so. It's become, it's, it's really nice, I get it. I love it, like having you know, a wood-burning stove, but it is a huge source of air pollution um, and definitely something that I hope when you leave today that you'll, you'll think about. One of the other sources of air pollution maybe you, maybe you haven't thought about or, or a way that we, which we impact it. So we, you know, we, we drive, we might burn wood, we draw power, we might uh, work in industry or, or, or at least use goods which are produced by industry. But we also have goods which are produced in other parts of the world. And there are people who've done calculations to say that how much of the things that we buy and bring over to our country, how can we associate that with air pollution elsewhere? So one example, so we, we have a, a lot of our uh, things that we consume is produced in China. And if you think about what is what we consume in Western Europe and the US uh, that's made in China, we can attribute that to 100,000 deaths in China from poor air quality. So even decisions that you make that are not making air pollution locally, you're encouraging an activity uh, through generation or through um, you know, some industrial activity which is then making pollution. So something that can happen at a distance. Question what to do about it. I think we've had a, a, great, a great example there of you know, something that we really might think about this corridor here. And, and as a cyclist, someone who cycles in from Morecambe most days, um, I should be appealing to my Pro Vice Chancellor and above to think about that. But I think we, we, there, there are two ways we can think about what we might do. One is, are these kind of behavior changes? You know, can, can we think about not going in a car? Can we think about not lighting our uh, wood-burning stove? Can we, can we make other decisions? At the same time, there are other things which act at a bigger level. So we call these structural changes. So the way that the world is sometimes makes it really hard for us to make other decisions. So Michael, in fact, gave the example of the buses, which are always full. You know, so we personally cannot have there be more buses. That is an issue which needs to be controlled at a higher level. We call that a, a structural issue. So if the local council were to consider uh, 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 if they had any role in this plan, or the way in which a city is configured, how can we plan where houses can be such that we encourage transport through um, bikes, through public transport, and remove people from the car. So I'm thinking on my feet now what my question might be. So my question to you was going to be, <laughs> if you were in the position to give up something that was causing poor air quality, what would you give up? But maybe, if this doesn't tread too much on your toes, Kevin, I'll say, if you had the power to change anything in the world, any of these structures, what would you like to change? Is that OK? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I wish I had that <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. I'll finish. Thank you, Paul. So it's really interesting thinking about how we measure air pollution, and of course inside as well as outside. And I don't know if anyone here caught a particular segment on the Channel 4 News a week ago in which there were children in a school in Bradford who were measuring pollution inside the classroom. And they interviewed the head teacher who said, well, we have to open the windows for COVID precautions. But as soon as we open the windows, of course, the school's on a busy road. And that lets air pollution in. So these children are measuring air pollution within their school. And then they're walking home. And they're looking at alternate routes that don't mean walking along a busy road. And this is really to introduce Douglas Booker here, who's co-founder of the National Air Quality Testing Center and uh, is a PhD student at LEC. And I think, Paul, you're his supervisor. I'm mine, yeah. <laughs> I'll make sure to say nice things. <laughs> so, over to you, Doug. 
Yeah, so thank you for the introduction, Jocelyn. So I run a company called NAQTS. As uh, Jocelyn said, we're in the Environment Centre on campus, and we design and develop air quality monitors to try and make the invisible visible. And really, we take a focus on indoor air quality. And I think Michael's pods do a really great job of demonstrating some of the challenges of air and indoor environments. Um, of course, it seems you know, particularly shocking when you look at the pod downstairs. You can see or, you know, a thick smoke. Um, but you could imagine even in a bigger space like this, it's just all of those same things might be present. It's just a much larger room and it's, it's dilute, uh, diluted over that space. And the reason we uh, really try to raise awareness of indoor air quality is because um, actually it's where most of our exposure happens. We spend around 90% of our time indoors, whether that is uh, at home, in a school, in a vehicle, which can be particularly polluted, um, or, or any other space, whether that be an office or so on and so forth. And there are significant sources from indoors, whether that be the furnishings we use, um, some of the building materials, but quite frankly, also, what is outside does come in. Um, air pollution doesn't stop at the front door. So some of those sort of scary concentrations you might see in the pod downstairs won't stay out, um, out downstairs, won't stay outdoors permanently. They will come in through things like open windows. So really, my job um, with, uh, with, uh, with NAQTS is to try and provide data to, to help people make informed decisions. And, and Jocelyn gave the really great example of some of the challenges we have in that space. Because really, what we, uh, what we measure defines what we consider to be air pollution, and then what we consider to be air pollution defines how we act. And the example with schools around COVID uh, and, and managing airborne virus transmission is a really great example of that. Previously, the concern had been from protecting children from poor outdoor air quality from uh, dirty diesel cars coming in. Uh, that shifted actually to be uh, managing uh, airborne viral particles through opening windows to, to get rid of them. But of course, uh, as we know, if you open a window, what is outside does come in. So really, some of the initiatives that you may have seen around putting things like carbon dioxide monitors in schools, um, carbon dioxide being uh, a really important thing to measure, not just for climate change, but it uh, primarily is coming out of people's mouths when they, when they speak, when they breathe and so is a useful indicator of uh, other potential viral particles. So using carbon dioxide as our proxy for good air quality indoors, um, we may be in fact able to, to bring that down by increasing ventilation, but as Jocelyn said, um, we may be replacing one problem with another, in this case, uh, mitigating COVID, but making the indoor air quality worse by bringing in outdoor air pollutants. So I'd just like to sort of finish with that in mind that Air quality is a, a multifaceted thing, and uh, how we act depends on what we measure. So really, we want to be measuring as many things as we can. Thank you. I'm, I'm aware that um, many of our speakers are speaking, of course, for quite a brief amount of time, and you may want to know more, and there will be lots of opportunities to follow up if you wish. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Rachel Isba, who is the Professor of Medicine here in the Faculty of Health and Medicine, uh, and is also a pediatrician, I believe. And she's going to talk a little bit about the impact, particularly on children's health. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I have a slightly weird job in that um, I'm a consultant in paediatric public health medicine, uh, but I work in an emergency department. Um, so my emergency medicine answer to the what about children is, all of this is going to be way worse for children. Um, but my public health doctor version of that is a little bit longer. So uh, the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, who were the people that organised us paediatricians looking after the children, um, have basically said, and I'll quote, that air pollution is the single greatest environmental threat to public health. Now, that's quite a big statement, given that there are quite a lot of things contending for the biggest threat to public health. So uh, the fact that they've made that statement in a position uh, statement last year, uh, I think conveys the seriousness of this situation for children. Children are going to live with all of this for much longer than most of the rest of us will. Um, and actually, there's evidence that the impacts of pollution start before birth. So uh, we're not just thinking about children walking to school, um, but actually before they're even born, they're exposed to the effects of pollution, uh, which for me is quite mind-blowing 
um, to be honest, as a doctor. Uh, and so we really need to be doing something about that. And I think as a, well, so my emergency department is in a socioeconomically deprived bit of Manchester, uh, which, and Manchester is socioeconomically deprived compared to the Northwest, and the Northwest compared to other bits of the UK. So the children that I'm caring for in the hospital uh, come from some, some of the most socioeconomically deprived areas uh, in the UK. And as with so many of these things, they're feeling the impact even more than other people. So it's compounded by the fact they're children, it's compounded uh, by the fact that they experience inequalities in their health and well-being every single day in every aspect of their lives. Um, and we've had some very, it's interesting, the pandemic, it took us a while, that's the longest conversation I've heard in a while before we got to the word pandemic, but actually we've heard a bit about how the pandemic and pollution intersect, but actually if we think about pollution as part of um, the climate catastrophe, then, and we think about the pandemic, um, the pandemic is, is almost certainly uh, likely to have arisen partly as a result of the things that we're doing to the planet, so I think um, children, again, experience all of this, so they're going to have the worst impacts of, of climate catastrophe, worst impacts of the pandemic, although perhaps not directly from the, the disease itself, but for all of the reasons we've talked about. And pollution is just another example of how we are disadvantaging those that will come after us. Uh, and I would argue that they are the most pe important people on the planet. Like, we don't matter. We need to sort it out for them, if, if for nothing else. So I'm going to be uncharacteristically brief for a public health doctor. Um, uh, and that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I notice we have quite a few children in the room. So when we've all finished speaking and we open up, it would be fantastic to hear. I think we have at least one eco-counselor. Do we have more? How many eco-counselors in the schools do we have? Anyone an eco-counselor? You are, as we have one eco counselor in the room. Um, so it'd be fantastic uh, to hear from, from children in the room, please, as well. I'll pass over to Simon. We've been talking a lot already about uh, being individuals, uh, citizens, the societies that we, that we share, and the planet that we all, we all occupy, and the relationships between them. And this is a topic that we look to environmental, environmental social science to help us understand. So we're very lucky to have with us Professor um, Christina Hicks, also from the Environment Centre, who's going to talk to us a bit about those complex interrelationships. Christina. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying the conversation here. Just, I think at one point I suddenly remembered that my first ever job was measuring air quality samples. And it set me off on a journey because I really wanted to discover <laughs> Where do these samples come from? What do they mean? And who do they impact? So as the guy said, I'm an environmental social scientist, which means I ask or I tackle applied or practical questions um, in an interdisciplinary way. And so I'm interested in how environmental change affects people or impacts people. So in good ways, so improving well-being or improving nutrition, as well as in bad ways, so pollution, the impacts of climate change, and malnutrition. What, what everyone's been talking about today um, terrifies me a little bit um, because of the severity of the situation that Rachel and Paul have really underscored. Um, but also, I think, as Rachel pointed out, because the impacts fall differently across different people and across different communities. Um, and very often, the people who are going to bear the greatest brunt of our climate emissions, our air pollution, are those who are either vulnerable because they're children or elderly people or vulnerable for other reasons, or they lack resources, so they don't have the wealth um, to get the... Um, or they lack representation. They don't have access to decision making. So they, they don't have the ability to influence the choices that are made around the policies and practices that we make or take at local, national and international scales. Now, this isn't new. The fact that these impacts fall unevenly across the world has been known for a long time. In the 1970s, um, Bullard from the United States um, and his wife 
realized that African-American and poorer communities were often where toxic waste facilities were being cited. So this led to um, a whole movement called environmental justice um, and um, political actions and um, the development of a whole field. Um, so we've got Gordon Walker here in L Lancaster University who's written some of the foundational books on this work. But despite some notable wins, um, so environmental justice is in some laws, um, and despite a whole field dedicated to this issue, injustices today are just as severe as they were 50 years ago. And partly that's because the impacts are escalating. They're also increasingly interconnected. So issues of climate change, of malnutrition, um, in intersect and overlap, and they're increasingly globalized. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work that I do. Um, I, I work on fisheries, um, and recently I've been working in West Africa. And I work on fisheries because fish are a really nutritious source of food. So they pack a really powerful punch. They give us these vital micronutrients that are really important to young children. Um, um, and so they're good for us. And so there's been a real rapid rise in aquaculture, um, the development of, of farmed fish. And so salmon in the UK is, is incredibly cheap now compared to what it was, which is great. We've got access to cheap forms of nutritious foods. But in West Africa, in Senegal, what's been happening recently, um, so West Af Senegal and West Africa is an interesting place because climate change is really squeezing um, the West African coastline. Desertification from land and climate impacts are driving fish populations north and resulting in smaller sized fish. So the catches are projected to plummet. And malnutrition is common um, and it's a low income country. So these fish meal factories, fueled by the global demand for fish meal, which feeds livestock but also our farmed fish, have sprung up along the West African coastline, bringing in really valuable sources of foreign income but polluting the local environment, leading to air pollution problems, and critically, removing a source of really cheap and really nutritious food from the local markets. So I think picking up on Paul's point about the interconnected nature of a lot of our challenges nowadays, we're, we're exporting inadvertently a lot of our impacts or our emissions. So my question is, how do we get ahead of ourselves. The reason why, in addressing some of our solutions, we create injustices elsewhere is because we're addressing problems that we should have addressed 20 years ago. How can we get to a place where we're addressing problems? How can we develop policies that are fit for 20 years' time? And how can we minimize these injustices and inequities that we inadvertently or sometimes intentionally create? Thank you. Provided a brilliant segue there because you started talking about policies. And our next speaker is Councillor Kevin Freer, who's cabinet member and deputy leader uh, with particular responsibility for the climate emergency. But he also runs Climate Emergency UK, which is developing a kind of database of people who have made the climate emergency declaration and seeking to support those kind of organisations by sharing best practice. So, Kevin, please, the floor is yours. Wow, I love coming uh, pretty close to the end of a panel of speakers because every one of them gives you a little kind of hook to which on which to talk and Michael's is still very much you know what the the, the A6 is a kind of uh, an example of just how complex and just how ultimately um, disappointing um, politicians are at addressing these problems and developing the policies, the, the holistic policies, if you need, uh, to address it. And I don't, there are some things we haven't talked about um, yet. We haven't talked about COP26, really, and just how potentially disappointing that's going to be, because fund, at the fundamental, um, which has been touched on, is we have to stop using fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are at the root of 
the, the problems with air pollution, they're at the root of the problems with, with climate change. But what we almost never talk about is that we live on one planet and we have planetary limits and it's not just climate change. Climate change is a symptom, if you like, of the way that we are living on the planet and not taking account of the fact that we've got a, a finite planet, we need to share it up fairly. I, I never hear those conversations at all. Um, and I can only talk about them because I, I, I actually did a master's in human ecology, which looked at the kind, because I was trying to understand what it was that was stopping us from doing, you know, we know about these things. We've known about air quality and, and climate change for a very long time and all the other environmental pollutants. And we're still hearing stories every day about raw sewage being pumped into, into rivers and things like that. And politicians saying, we are not going to do anything about it. That ha that's what happened with raw sewage yesterday in Parliament. So... Looking to politicians for action is not necessarily going to get us very far. They've failed us time after time. There's a brilliant video from the Climate Art Project that have, uh, tr have got clips of uh, American politicians, but you could do the same with British ones, over 40 years, with a uh, graph showing the... Um, showing carbon emissions going up and up and up in an exponential curve. And the politicians are saying, yep, this is a really serious problem. Maggie Thatcher, to her credit, in the 1980s said, this is the number one problem that the, the Earth faces. And as the politicians make their promises, the graph goes up and up and up. And I don't see it turning just yet. I don't see it turning as a result. You know, the IPCC have just said that politicians have got to really step up their, their commitments to get that curve to, to start going down. They're not doing it. So I'm going to relate it to um, the, lo uh, lo the local issue of the A6 because it, it illustrates some of the, 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 the difficulties that we have. So Lancaster declared a climate emergency. Most councils in the country declared a climate emergency. Most of them have developed action plans. Those action plans, I, I did a search of our database, a lot of them cover air pollution, a lot of them um, mention, because lo local authorities are responsible for doing something about it, they're responsible for, for um, declaring air quality management zones, and we have um, Goldgate and, and uh, Lancaster and Carnforth de so designated. Um, I don't remember once, I've only been a councillor for four years, but I don't remember us ever talking about air quality, but we are talking about climate change. So obviously the two being so interconnected, um, the, it's a good thing uh, that we're talking about climate change at last. But when it, came to making, when it comes to making decisions about the A6 and how people get in and out, there is a transport master plan that is supposed to be, and it's been around for quite a while, it's been around as long as I've been a councillor, um, and we are a district council, so there's a county council. The county council are responsible for transport, but, we, but obviously they talk to us as a district council and we work together. Um, there is a master plan. It does um, address trying to reduce traffic, trying to increase the uh, ability to walk and cycle and better buses and things like that. Things came to a bit of a crunch recently because the government decided in their wisdom to spend £26 billion on new roads. Now, um, that shows you where, where the current priorities are. So Lancaster City Council had to make a decision about whether to agree with the county council that we would accept money to, to uh, build a new um, junction at uh, Junction 33. Now, it, again, it's so complex. The... Um, the thing in favour was that by bypassing Goldgate, you would improve air quality in Goldgate, so therefore that would be better air quality for the people in Goldgate. Um, as it happens, um, generally the people in Goldgate still said, no, actually we, we don't really want that because it also comes with uh, building an awful lot of houses. Um, but it... Um, the, the other way it was sold was by saying, we will have a bus rapid transit system and we will have a cycle superhighway from here into Lancaster. 
And when I started to unpick all of that, okay, bus super, um, bus rapid transit implies that you have a dedicated bus lane both ways. The A6 has only got two lanes, so where's that going to go? And then I discovered that actually they're calling it better buses now, and maybe the, um, the traffic lights will be programmed to give a bit of priority to, to buses. So there is no plan to either... Um, they're, they're really proud of the fact that we've, got all, we've finally got all Euro 6 buses now, so there's no plan at the moment, and, and that gets even more complicated because it's not just the district council or the, or the county council, but the buses are privately run. So, you know, there's got to be incentives for the bus operators to, to switch to electric buses. So it gets incredibly complicated, but when it comes down to it, what is prioritised is business as usual. So with the road decision, nobody really cared in the decision-making process, and the decision was made in the end by 60 councillors. No, nobody really sort of thought, oh, well, we can't have those houses if it means that, you know, there, there's no holistic thinking in all of these things. And that, that's a really important thing to, to grasp. You know, these things are really complicated and there's lots of things to weigh up. But at the end of the day, business as usual trumps everything. So the decision was made on, on, um, on the road, not because of climate change, although many of us um, argued very strongly. The council is very fragmented. Although I'm deputy leader and we have a green leader, we're only a quarter of the councillors. Nobody listened to evidence. I, I don't remember one occasion when people said, you know, because I worked out that, that actually building the road would, would blow a quarter of our carbon emissions, uh, our carbon budget. And um, there, was, there was no report about that. And nobody challenged that. It, it was actually insignificant in the decision-making process. And we didn't talk about air quality at all, apart from the, the benefits to, to Goldgate. What it came down to in the end was the government are giving us this money, the government wants us to do this, the county council want to do this. Um, it will provide lots of housing, and the, 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 the big story is we need to build more houses. We're not worried about the embodied carbon emissions of that. We're not actually really worried about the... Um, and I'm talking a bigger we than just the, the district council and not that bothered about the, the, the quality. And you know, Houses are still being built that are not fit for the future. They're, 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 they're not low carbon. We as a district council, you, you, you've almost got all these things working against each other. So we have a lot of people in the district council who are doing fabulous work on trying to make developers build to a, a zero carbon home standard. But equally then, you've got other decisions being made that kind of go against that. So although we're supposed to have a priority of, you know, climate emergency is the number one priority, it gets lost amongst all these other complexities. There's no leadership from the top. There's no leadership from the national government. The, um, the county council's a lot better now. They, there's a big change in May, same political party, but they've now got a cabinet member for climate change. They're slowly getting their heads around it. Is anyone treating the climate, never mind air quality, as an emergency? In the country, we've looked at all their plans. The answer is no. Um, how can, my question to you will be, how can you, uh, given that your politicians are absolutely failing you, what can you do to um, do something about that? Because ultimately... Politicians are voted in by, by everybody. There's incredibly complex relationship about um, that, that Professor Becky Willis, who's also based here in Lancaster, looks at, you know, how do you influence politicians and, 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 and things like that. When, when she talks to national politicians, they think that, that you, the, the, the voters, don't want them to be too ambitious about things. Um, and actually then, you know, people will say it's our number one priority. But then when you start to uh, do things in town, or talk about doing things in town that, that reduces traffic, the shopkeepers are up in arms because they think it's going to affect their trade. I could go on and on and on and on. It's incredibly complex. The leadership is not there. The councillors don't really get it. And they don't, li they don't always... You know, we had over 100 emails from people saying, don't vote for that road, don't for those extra houses. They were absolutely ignored. 
So just writing to your councillors doesn't work. Um, yeah, I haven't got any answers, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, thank you. So Richard's going to read out the questions we all need to answer now. Hello, everyone. Uh, so to recap, what would it take for you to give up your car or private vehicle? If you had the power to change any one of the structures, which would it be? How do we get ahead of ourselves? Specifically, how do we start to create policies that will look 20 years ahead? actually make some change happen and what can you do to influence politicians to create change not that i'm answering this at all but i think it would be really great to hear some ideas from you i mean we all can see that this is very clearly an issue that can cause us i mean i often respond to this like i'm sure many it's so overwhelming that you feel helpless powerless to do anything at all and I think one of the benefits of doing events like this is to empower each other so it'd be really great to hear uh, from you if you could just like throw your arm up in the air between Richard and I we will get the microphone to you but I'd just like to prioritize I know we've got medical students in the room and I know we have one eco counselor and some other children um, so please if you want to speak or ask a question Please just raise your, your hands and we'll get the microphone to you. Who wants to start? Hello. Um, I have a question about the second question. It says there are, the st there are structures that, that can be changed. What if I don't know what the structures are? Like After hearing Councillor's um, explanation, I kind of know, but still it's like not really there in my head and um yeah like what are the how do i know what are the structures and how can the structures be changed when they've been around for so long sorry i don't have an answers either <laughs> so as i gave the second question i'll give first response so that's an excellent question <laughs> that's what it would be an excellent one to replace it with yeah, I think, uh, and I'm just only going to add to complicate to your question is that how should you go about changing them anyway? <laughs> what, what do we do? We see so um, Becky Willis's name got mentioned. So so Becky is a, a colleague of ours up in the Environment Centre, and her research is how can we bring more democracy into these kind of decisions? So yeah, I guess I'm not answering a question, but I think i'm pretty uh, certainly with, around with with becky's ideas at least of a way in which we can understand the environment and where we want to go next i think play, things that include you know it's not just academics it's not just politicians it's not other people who are in power but it actually is about the community who uh, who is uh, affected um, I just, to follow up on the structure thing i think the problem with thinking about structures is people aren't aware they're there they don't know what a, a structure is. So let's, if we look at roads, we have pavements and we have a road. And on the road, there's cars and on pavements, there's people walking. And then you have a child who's about eight or nine and you're deciding, do they cycle on the pavement and get lots of people shouting at them? Or do they cycle on the road and get run over? Um, and then you have electric scooters and everyone goes, these are terrible. They're everywhere. They're on the pavement, on the road. Well, there's nothing wrong with an electric scooter. Its infrastructure hasn't moved with the times. And what we have is a road that is, or a, a, a route that is 50 years out of date. It allows people to walk and drive, but nothing in between. But until you raise that as an issue, you're not aware that you are actually running in an infrastructure. So you, most people don't think oh, I need to change infrastructure, because they're not even aware of it's an infrastructure. And that's physical things. And then when you get to political infrastructures, whoa. <laughs> and legal infrastructures, and it's like, whoa, you know. So um, I think there's a huge education about what, um, how to kind of make bare infrastructures so we can actually break them down and realize how much of that actually drives our life and our way of thinking. Our language is an infrastructure. So we need a vocabulary to be able to talk about these things. If the words aren't there, we can't talk about them. So 
you know, everything needs to be broken down. So in that way, it's a really good question, I think. Can I just quickly add, and maybe just one way, as, as you were talking, Michael, maybe think about, so one way to visualise that is, you could think about, do things have to be the way that they are? Maybe that's another way of, yeah. of phrasing it. Never, never, never take it for granted, any part of your life. It's like, nothing is a given, everything can change. I noticed a hand at the front before, so I'll go over here, and then we'll go to the next person. If we all start riding bikes, how much would it help and if we if we plant more trees how much would it help so my question is which one will get rid of the pollution more yeah so if i, if I could um, talk about the bikes um actually this friday um, we've got what's called a critical mass, which happens every month in a lot of cities around the country. And the idea with that critical mass is to take over the road. So at the moment, the roads belong to the cars. And there's, you know, there's a, some of us will, will cycle and take those risks. And others, for others, it's too risky. So obviously, we need to... to get more road space for bikes. We need to take over the roads. So the more, you know, it's, it's like the more people who cycle, the more road space might be given over to them. But at the moment, the motorist is king. And even just putting little bike lanes like we did for COVID with, with little sticks there, motorists said, no, that's taking away our road space. So we've got to cycle more. We've got to demand more space for bikes. And we've got to just take over the roads. <laughs> and you mentioned trees too, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Was... Any comments on trees? I mean, the, the question was a comparator, wasn't it? Like, which is more effect? Is that right? Uh, trees or bikes, which makes the most difference? I don't think she meant that. I no. Think just trying to get a sense of mm. what, could, what could she do. Yeah. I mean, the trees is really interesting in terms of carbon offsetting because it's seen as a, it's, one, it's a bit like the electric car, a bit of a panacea. like we'll build this and we'll plant a thousand trees. And um, it is kind of limited value in that. It stores carbon for a certain amount of time, but only as long as the tree is relatively young and then it stores less. And then of course with forest fires, then they burn anyhow and release the carbon into the air. But trees are nice things, unless you have an allergy and uh, set them up. <laughs> really quick, I'll give a quick, so absolutely, because a lot of our pollution comes from cars. So if we all go on bikes, which I think just a straight, straight what you're asking, be brilliant, because that, that will get rid of all that pollution. And trees, one thing we haven't said, so trees, they take carbon dioxide in, so that's good for the climate, but they can also absorb pollution as well. So that's a really other good reason to have trees, and they're beautiful. Um, thank you. Uh, it was great to hear from you all, so thanks for that. And I just wanted to return to the, f the first question we had and also that question around structure. Um, I think that for me, maybe an answer to that is around our democratic structure, because that's the field I work in. Um, I'm actually working with Becky Willis as well. Her name's mentioned a lot tonight, but um, <laughs> on, a, on a, citizen, a climate assembly project, um, down in Guildford and um, for me around the idea of democratic structures and how decisions are made I feel like it's been talked about a lot tonight of taking a different approach that's more about uh, a systems thinking approach rather than saying oh well there's this infrastructure here and we're talking about transport and then we're talking about 
agriculture, and then we're talking about housing as if they're all these separate things. But the way we live our lives isn't as all of those things are separate. And the way that we can engage with these questions of what needs changing is kind of in the form of stories. And I think that that's maybe where we come back to the, the pods or Michael, when you were talking about the, the kid walking along the pavement, right? And do they go on the bike on the pavement or do they go on the road? And, and suddenly we can think, oh, that's how that thing should change. And so the way we're approaching this citizens' assembly is rather than saying, oh, we're going to look at agriculture and we're going to look at housing, what we're doing is we're going to look at stories and we're going to look at narratives and uh, how can we create policy change as a group of citizens? How can we write recommendations that are based on the way people live rather than uh, these structures that feel very abstract uh, to us all in our day-to-day -day lives? So I guess... Um, that's maybe kind of a bit of an answer to question two from my work um, on uh, climate governance. Yeah. Uh, did, anybody, did anybody want to respond to that before I pass the mic on? Well, I've put in a, a research proposal before to work with communities to have them think about you know, how could the future be different through storytelling, through working, um, working with colleagues who, who are in, in different departments in the university, and it didn't get funded. So if there's anyone here who's got <laughs> some money, then please come and talk to me afterwards. But yeah, I, th I really think that, yeah, this idea of, I think, of stories is a way to communicate with communities. I totally agree with you. Yeah, brilliant. Maybe I'll, I'll just jump on that. And I, I love your response. I think that's, you know, that's exactly where we want to go. Um, but I suppose I would like to push us to see, well, how do we take that beyond... The local narratives and how do we make those stories and narratives and those processes you know empower the, everyone in in decision making there so i guess yes i'll just take it back to the global <laughs> but thank you i love you yeah and we had a, a citizens assembly in uh, lancaster uh we didn't do it quite quite like that we, it was a bit segmented but we had a, a kind of follow-up on monday again with becky there and what was really clear was that giving people an opportunity to really kind of have a deep discussion, you know, so often it's so superficial, but when people really kind of connect with each other and connect with the issues and discuss them and so on, they get really empowered and really kind of fired up. So we've got now, you know, one of the great benefits of having had a people's assembly is you've got all these people who didn't otherwise think of it as, as their top issue who now do, so yeah, it's, a, it's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'd like to follow up um, on what the last few speakers have actually said, um, and I would like to broaden it even further. So we do have some children and young people in the room with us, and they've asked us a question, but I didn't didn't, wasn't allowed to ask a question at the end of my little five minutes. So I'm going to ask it now. So my question is, there are a lot of grown-ups in this room as well, and um, grown-ups don't always listen to children and young people, but I would say that all the grown-ups in this room currently have their ears in the on position, I think it's fair to say. So are there any children and young people in the room who would like to tell us something? So what is most important to you? So thinking, I think everybody's been talking about adults, grown-ups, basically. So I want to know, what do the children and young people think? Like, this is your opportunity. If you could tell us grown-ups, or if we're going to think even bigger, if you could tell the boss grown-up, and I use inverted commas with the grown-up in this case, Boris Johnson, so the Prime Minister, what, would, what, do you, what do you want to ask him? What do you want to tell him? So you're here with us, and that is fantastic. And I, we've only heard one child so far. I, as a paediatrician, would like to hear from you. So... We had some hands at the back, I think. Excellent. Do you want to raise them again just so we can see you? I talk too much. It's your turn. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm just going to take over. Oh, there take, you go. You're you, still you're there. Welcome I didn't to take it. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Um, I wanted to ask, um, could we ever, like, um, have totally clean air? Like, would it be a good thing to have totally clean air? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doctor says well, yes. Why not? Is there any, why not? 
thing. Also interesting, is there clean air anywhere? And that's a really, that's a really hard question. But yeah, it's a really good question for Alex. And it's a really good, you definitely, definitely want to have clean air. But um, this, the air, even, even in the Arctic where no one lives, it's still polluted from, uh, from what we do. Well, we can certainly do much better. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Yeah, you got solutions. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, the, when, I mean, when you look at the problems in China and India and a lot of countries around the world, the air pollution problem is a very, very complex problem. But when you look at most of the cities in Britain, which are not industrial anymore, I mean, you look at New Delhi, you know, you've got industry, you've got crop burning, you've got poorly surfaced roads, you've got poor quality diesel, you've got a lot of out of date vehicles, all of that. I mean, it's a really complex mix. You look at somewhere like London, or most cities now, because we have hardly any industry, you just stop driving and the problem goes away. I mean, other than those wood burning people. And that's just a kind of yuppie <laughs> thing, right? So get rid of some wood burning, get rid of the cars. So like, I was following the air pollution index in London and one day, so the air pollution index, you know, is a kind of a combination of all these chemicals that we've been talking about. And WHO say it shouldn't exceed 40. I think it's gone down to less now. It's, it's often 60, 70, 80 in London. Um, in somewhere like New Delhi, it can exceed 1,000. But one day I noticed that it was only six in London. And it lasted for three or four days, which is like better than Norway, in fact. And then I've just realised it was a day that there was this massive anti-Brexit march on. And everyone walked in and there was no traffic. And that was it. It dropped to six. And on that day it was six. But what's even more interesting is for the next few days until like the following Wednesday, it stayed really low. So it's not like one of these things like trying to turn the tide on climate change where if we put the brakes on now, it's still going to go up and it's going to take a long time. You, we can put the brakes on this tomorrow if we wanted to. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for all the speakers. I want to address the second question, but also to kind of get back to some of the, what we mentioned earlier. Um, I thought the big elephant in the room here is inequalities that Rachel mentioned as well. And when we talk about this change, so what, what's been mentioned now is basically just the redistribution of the pollution in the country. So the pollution gets away from London, but goes somewhere else where stuff that gets to London gets produced. And even if you think of Lancaster, we have different areas here. We have very tidy areas. We can go where there's no rubbish, there is no nothing lying on the street, or we have a very clean canal. And you can walk down the canal and see a very different image what you find inside the water in the canal. You can see a lot of beer cans, bottles. And I think that's a fundamental problem. And then if we, do, if we don't have good government that can address those inequalities, how is the public, we, what can we do, if anything, um, to empower ourselves to change? Because we can't have conflict of interest, you know, someone needs something, they'll have it if they have power. And the person who gets the blame is someone who actually can't do anything, they just need to get to work on their car because they actually live really far, you know, so they can afford the accommodation. Um, I guess I just want to throw that in because it's quite a big thing to think about and it's kind of something we need to think about as well and it's at the root of everything. Um, yeah, thank you. Should we go straight into another question and then respond to both? Uh, I just wanted to ask the, what if we could use like electric cars forever and reduce air pollution and stuff? I mean, you've already talked about electric cars, and I think I'll just go, I'll, I'll, if I yeah. may, I'm going to repeat your point because yeah. you, I was going to say it anyway. Um, so electric cars, good, definitely much better than, um, than uh, petrol cars and uh, diesel cars, but they still produce pollution. So as Michael said, like, they, they, they can be quite heavy, so when they hit the road, 
and when they apply the brakes, you get all these little particles that come off. And if, they, if you breathe those in, that that's, can be bad for your health. So the, really the difficult thing to do is we need fewer cars. So we, don't, we can't replace every car with an electric car. That's no good. We want, to, we want um, fewer cars. That's what I would say to that one. Would that be? Yeah, I mean... I think the thing about a car, there's a lovely little video I saw, I can't remember, where this guy drives up to a local shop with his four-wheel drive massive thing, buys a pint of milk and sticks it in the back and drives home. <laughs> and it's like, um, I think electric vehicles are really interesting, but you know, you have scooters, you have bicycles, and we can invent a million other things that are not as big as a car. Very rarely do we need the whole car. We need a bit of a car. We just need to get somewhere maybe a little faster than we like, and we need somewhere to put a pint of milk, you know? <laughs> and that's it, you know? So we need to rethink. And the, the great thing about electric vehicles is that we don't have a huge engine anymore. It's actually, um, engines are just an incredible bit of engineering. I mean, they are incredible, but they're quite big. And now, an all you have is a battery and a motor and a computer processor to run it, um, and some wheels. So that's really tiny. And um, we, we've got to design a completely new array of vehicles now. Um, and we might go out one day and walk, the other day we cycle, the other day we kind of go on our milk, pint of milk transporter. So we need to, and it's for young people to rethink what transport is now and how that can work. to the inequalities yeah. question as well. So, I mean, I, I, obviously, I, I think the inequalities aspect is, is critical. I think Michael at the beginning talked about, you know, when you, if we're, if we're trying to get people, that, so there's the inequalities, the distributions of the, 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 the impacts currently, but then there's also of who's going to be able to transition. So Michael talked about if we're going to get everyone off the roads, well, certain people can't ride bikes certain people, so, so thinking about all of those inequalities I think is, is critical. But maybe I think you were talking perhaps about the, the unequal distribution of current pollution and that's sort of the history of environmental justice and it's communities, you know, exercising their political voice and taking to the streets and, you know, it doesn't always work. I think as Kevin, you know, letters don't always work but, you know, occupying the streets and making sure that you know, the government can't not listen. But I think inequalities on both sides of the, of, of, of the problem need, really need to be central in how we address these issues, otherwise I think we'll, we'll fail. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Oh. <laughs> um, so, Kevin, you were saying earlier um, that for example, the pollution is a symptom of the way that we're living. Um, and I'm just wondering, we put a lot of attention onto external conditions, changing pollution, changing our environment, changing cars, technology and so on. Um, I'm wondering if all of these problems are a symptom of the way we're living, do you think we ought to put more emphasis on changing or transforming our own minds and our own attitudes? Because from those, if we can have more contented minds, more contented attitudes, we're less likely, for example, to overproduce, and then we're less likely to pollute the planet, and so forth. So I think this, this is one of, this is an answer to how can we create change in the future and looking ahead 20 years time, and even longer. I would say perhaps one of the most important things is to try to become more content in ourselves, and we can do that personally. We can work on that. Um, by improving our own value system and so forth. So that's an answer. I'm just wondering what you might like to say about that. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there, there have been so many studies, I'm sure, done that show what makes people really happy are, are kind of connections with people, being in nature and things like that. They're not high-polluting activities. Um, and the idea that we've just got to work harder and harder um, and earn more and more money. And one thing I wanted to say earlier was that there's a direct correlation between how much money you have and how polluting you are and how, how much carbon emissions that, that you uh, create. So if, there was, if people 
um, had less money, worked less hard, had more time to enjoy being in nature, to enjoy family and, and friends and things like that, that would have a massive impact. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm a third-year medical student. I'm also a member of the Lancaster Arts Board. Um, and as a medical student, I see on almost a day-to-day -day basis uh, the strain that we already have on all the healthcare services. Um, we've already discussed tonight the, the kind of link between the pandemic uh, and air pollution. Uh, given the fact that we're almost resigned to the idea that COVID is going to become endemic, uh, how do we manage that and air pollution moving forward? And how do we reduce the strain on healthcare services in that respect? Solve that real quick. <laughs> do you want to respond to that first, perhaps, because that's a big question before moving on to the next one? Any responses to that? That's quite a big question. Why is everyone looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> So, so certainly from the community that I work in, which is a lot with mechanical and electrical engineers, some of the big solutions that are being suggested are actually in how we treat the building stock and, and how we use them, how many people we put in them, and what sort of technologies we're using. Um, many buildings are really quite outdated, not this lovely new one. And for example, we've done a lot of work in school classrooms where they have uh, extremely outdated ventilation systems, uh, timetabling strategies that are going to really um, uh, make it a, a, a fertile ground for virus transmission. So, it, so it's on two fronts. It's both in uh, sort of updating some of the building stock, uh, better ventilation systems, better filtration systems, but then thinking about some of the social practices and way we organise the school day to, I think, both minimise potential virus transmission, but also some of the other things that are considered indoor air pollutants. So, you know, typically before the pandemic, carbon dioxide was a problem for concentration. We've all probably been in a two-hour maths lesson in the afternoon when we were at uh, secondary school and thought you're feeling particularly tired. Uh, probably not your fault. It's 30 people in the classroom exhaling for, for two hours. So, yeah, that's one potential solution, but obviously it's going to be multifaceted. Can I? Super quick. So, I mean, I, I'm not going to solve like, all the health problems, but I think you know, some of the things we heard there about, I think, like values, changing values and changing things that we do. So if we, and I guess this is, I don't want to speak for you, Rachel, but I think like, from a population health point of view, you know, if we can, it's not just about medicine. If we, can, if we go about doing, uh, doing things differently, we, we, um, there are positives for the environment and positives for our health. And I should say really quickly also about the, the we haven't said is that when we had all these lockdowns during COVID, um, we actually decreased, air pollution went down because the number of cars went down. Now, that was a really bad way to enforce a change on people because, because lots, lots of people who don't have lovely white collar jobs, who still needed to be out there, were still exposing themselves to, to, to risk. You know, it, it, didn't, it didn't help them. But maybe, if I'm allowed to put a silver lining to it, it did show us that change is possible. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, I, that's a fantastic question. And the fact that you're one of our students and you've asked that warms my heart greatly. Um, so I, just a follow up point from um, for Paul. Like most of health, uh, most of health is not anything to do with medicine. Like medicine is the tiniest bit of health. It's what we do when it all goes wrong. And actually, if you look at the wider determinants of health, everything else is health. And I think we've talked about that quite a lot. Um, and I'd also like to add, like, add a PS to your question, which and fits with one of the other questions, the question about what do we do for the next 20 years? What do we do now to stop the next pandemic? Because, you know, I don't want to call it swine flu, but I'll call it swine flu anyway. Um, <laughs> from a virological perspective, it makes me itchy to call it that. But it wasn't that long ago. I mean, it, you know, it was if you're a, a young person in the room. Um, but for those of us working in the NHS, it genuinely wasn't that long ago. Um, and so, you know, how long is it going to be till the next one? And what do we do now um, for pollution, for uh, climate change, for all of these other things, which, as I said before, are likely to have contributed to the origin of this pandemic entirely possibly. And think about other things. So swine flu is called swine flu because we blamed it on the pigs because that's where it started. 
you know. So that's a zoonosis. That's something that normally lives in one species and has come over to us as human beings. You know, what else is there brewing that will accidentally, uh, you know, facilitate the next pandemic, um, chopping down rainforests, for example? So it's a, an excellent question. Um, I'm very proud of you for asking that, genuinely. Uh, but yeah, my PS would be, what do we do for the next pandemic as well? Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. This has been really interesting and such good questions. So I wrote a few notes. Um, I just wanted to add to Kevin's point that both, it's not just politicians, obviously, it's institutions with climate emergency plans are also <coughs> failing. Um, and I think I'd like to answer the question of what can I do to get politicians or institutions to change? And my answer in that, at least in part, is to, to start with a challenge. So. Yeah, I think how to change things is at least to start by challenging structures. So in that spirit, my challenge or, you know, my, my letter writing right now um, is a specific air pollution issue. As, as Simon Guy is here with us, in light of the university's climate emergency declaration, how does the university defend its position not to publicly oppose or withdraw support as a stakeholder of the new motorway junction that passed through council in August? Yeah, well, I mean, this is an icon. Yeah, yeah as, as Kevin said, this is a very kind of complex issue, and obviously things have changed, changed over, the process, over the time in which uh, the, the decisions have been made. And I think one of, the, one of the, um, the issues that we need to talk about, we're talking about transport, and, you know, what, would it, what difference would it make giving up your car? And one of the answers to that actually is housing again, and local housing. So we probably don't have time here to go through all of the details of the complexity about, about this, <coughs> but at least one of the elements here is facilitating that kind of possibility. Um, so a, a complex question, but um, not something that the university could just come out and firmly oppose, we felt, at the time. And as Kevin has described, a process went on that the university was not part of to, to, to support the decision. Um, and so that's where we are now. Thank you very much. Um, hi, my name's Tanya. Um, Michael, I just wanted to come back to your first question. I think it was yours about what would it take to give up a private vehicle. Um, so we're a family of four, two young children at school. We run a business. Um, so we have a petrol car and a diesel car. Um, in our household, we've done a lot to, to you know, thinking about reducing plastic waste we've looked at electric vehicles we've looked at electric scooters which are currently illegal uh, yeah we're not allowed them on the roads we do a lot to cut down on our we walk wherever we can we cycle wherever we can but there's this last barrier for us as a family to get rid of our cars which are essentially our livelihoods you know we wouldn't earn money if we couldn't go out in our cars our lives are very busy so that vehicle is the quickest way from A to Z. You know, I, I sound like a, a confessional at the minute, you know, it's almost like, hi, I'm Tanya, I'm a car driver, but I, I don't see what else as a family we can do. You know, electric cars are fairly expensive. We've researched it, haven't we? We sit up researching electric cars and we almost feel like, well, in 10 years, there's gonna be a better option. So why would we spend the money now when we own our vehicles? getting an electric car that's gonna be better in five, 10 years. We're almost in this rock and a hard place as a family that, that that's our only option. So when you say, what would it take to give up your private vehicle? The way we see it at the minute is there's no other viable option for 100% of our journeys to give up our private vehicles. We just couldn't do it. So, I mean, I, I phrased that question very accurately because I'm not saying I'm not, you know, if I say, what will it take? See, what you've done is you've discussed all the, the barriers. I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly what they are from what you say. It might be that you live too far away from your work or you live too far away from your schools. I mean, how, how far away do you live from your school? Uh, so we do live 
probably about five miles from the school. Um, so that is changing when the children go to high school, so they will be walking. With our business, we work from home, so we do as much Zoom calling as possible. We're financial advisors, so a lot of our clients want to see us face to face. Um, right. And they might live 20 miles away, 25 miles away. And then you think, well, we could rely on the train, but we've done that a few times and just been sat at Preston Station waiting to get anywhere. You so so just, to, just to cut in, right? Yeah. You know, answers are, um, what would it take? It would take to have a school closer to where I live. Yeah. It would take my clients to be willing to engage with my business online. Yeah. 100% of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, so those are the kind of things. It would take a local train transport surface that was reliable and had a grain that was sufficient for me to get where I'm going. Because, you know, I'm saying I'm in a very privileged position. I live in King's Cross, right? You know, I can cycle to almost everywhere in half an hour, 40 minutes. There's a brilliant public transport system. It might not be the cheapest, but it is really good. So there's absolutely no reason for me to have a car. So in a way, that's why I'm structuring, structuring that question that way. It's like, maybe there needs to be more local schools. Maybe there needs to be a better public transport infrastructure. Maybe we need some new technology like a scooter for the pint of milk and you can scoot up out. You know, and maybe you I, let go I, yeah, of... Yeah, I think the electric scooters are brilliant. Yeah. And I think we'd invest in them as a family. You know, there's a lot of places. We live on Morecambe Prom, so we yeah. can probably get seven miles in a direct line on an electric scooter, which is something we would do. But we can't do that. There's legislation, so the legislation so, needs to change yeah. for us to be able to give up our private vehicles to be able to do so that. So that's the story, you know, and that's going back to you. That's the narrative. Mm. So then you have to look at, OK... That's a narrative, that's a barriers. Now, what will change those? And then we need to look at how to actually create those things that you're probably like 90, I mean, I'm making this up, 95% of the population of Britain. And if we don't deal with those barriers, we're nowhere with this climate change debate or to change it around. And we're nowhere with the air pollution problems. So. We have to rethink, you know, is it? Uh, I, mean, um, I mean, right now, one of my heroes is the, Pav you know, the, the mayor of Paris, you know? She's changed everything. She's got the kind of 10-minute or the 15-minute city. Everything is available 15 minutes away. All of, you know, parking on the street has been taken away, changed into cycle lanes. And the amount of opposition to her, you can't imagine. She was very much on her own. She got re-elected. She's pushed it through. I mean, that was not, not easy. I mean, it, you would know how hard that would be. Right? And, uh, but, it, you know, it is possible. Yeah, just to, to follow up on that, I, I do think there's been far too much emphasis on individual action. You know, all of these things are structural. They're top-down. Politicians need to be much braver. Where politicians have been braver, so in Waltham Forest... They decided to um, shut off streets and, and, and pedestrianise the streets. A lot of opposition, they stuck to it. And now everybody loves it. So, you know, we do require quite a, a, a whole... You know, if you, when it comes to the next election, vote for the person who's the bravest. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm also a councillor alongside Kevin. And I just wanted to say that um, please vote. Please vote in local elections. Local government's really complicated. Um, I became a councillor and was absolutely flabbergasted by how complex the systems of government are in this area of the country. And one bonkers example of that is that I'm a city councillor and I can't do anything about the roads because that's the county council. And that's very annoying if you're a resident, and I appreciate that. But please vote. Vote in all the little elections, because if you tell your elected councillors how much this matters, if, if we had had 60 councillors in that vote over that road this summer, and Kevin and I campaigned long and hard against that motorway junction, and I'm absolutely devastated that it's gone ahead, 
but if there had been 60 councillors who had been against that, then it wouldn't have happened. Councillors have got to be brave. Councils have to be brave. We've got to make difficult decisions, so please put us under pressure. Please tell us and please vote. Um, I was very interested in what you were saying and it made me think, and in the equality question, it brought two things to mind. One of which was, we were going to make a structural change, and I'm just fantasising now, I'd do a basic income for everybody in the world. And the other thing I, I'm really interested in is, which kind of came up in the pandemic, is doing nothing, doing less, working less. I think the work ethic is really destructive. Um, my background's in journalism and communications, and I came up with this slogan I really like, which is, do nothing for climate change. <laughs> you know, let's... I, I went to... Here's a story. I went to Whitby um, Art Gallery, and there was, they were talking about Captain Cook in New Zealand, and there was a, a little story about the Maoris, and about before the missionaries arrived, the Maoris were... Um, hunting and gathering, but spending quite a lot of time sitting around chatting, socialising, having actually quite good lives. And then the missionaries came and said, idle hands, you know, you've got to work, introducing the work ethic and disease and everything else. And I think if we could value doing less, because one of the problems when you talked about the pressures on your lives, we put so much pressures on our lives that we have to get in a car to do things fast. So I think the pandemic taught us, those of us who were lucky, something about the value of doing less or being forced to do less. And as someone who's theoretically semi-retired, though it doesn't seem to work that way, if, but part of the reason, I do a lot, but part of the reason I do a lot of things that I value and think matter and because I have enough money. So I think if people had enough money for their basic needs, then they would be less forced to spend money and to do things that are destructive. So. Hi, yeah, Alison, I, I think I've been having the same fantasy next to you. It's like a little fantasy cloud. I was, you know, I'm, I'm an environmental scientist. I own a car. And um, I was, you know, sitting here thinking, really, why do I have that car? You know, I, I know I shouldn't have it. And it all comes down to time at the end. And I've got enough money, I, you know. And so, you know, what I was coming down to was that I love what I do. And if I slowed down, I'd be worried I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to do what I love. Um, so I think what I would like as a structure to change is the five-day week. Let's all get rid of a five-day week. We don't all need to work five days. We'd all Six still days. be able to do <laughs> less. Let's do less. There's less days. So that's what, that's what I would like as a structure. We've got maybe time for one or two more comments. As it's handed around, as you say, I agree wholeheartedly with both those comments. So obviously, that's a political opinion. I'm not basing that just in science. But yeah, UBI, four-day week, would solve a lot of things, I think, or address a lot of things. Any other comments or questions? Well, in a minute, can you all hear me without a microphone? <laughs> in a minute, we have Maya playing. But I just wondered, we've only got a couple of minutes. Is it worth, is there some urgent final comment that anyone would like to make. We've had such a wonderfully wide-ranging and very personal kind of response, which has been quite moving to hear. Sadly, because of the pandemic, you know, if this was a, a I don't like to use the word normal, but if this was the pre-time, 
it would be wonderful to have tea and eat these amazing COP26 biscuits and pick up on some of the threads that have happened. But sadly, we can't do that, so we need to go back into our own individual bubbles after hearing some music and let it percolate. But it seems to me it might be worth finding different ways of continuing this conversation as an immediate response. Over to you, Simon. Well, <laughs> on that note, yeah, we always saw, I think, the COP26 festival as the start of a conversation, really. So we've tried, I think we've had um, uh, 150, 1,500 people attend about 39 different events over the, over the week, I think, with the statistics. So I think we can truly say we've started the conversation. But I think we're open to ideas about how we continue it. I think Lancaster Arts in particular is a great shining example of the way it uses arts and culture to create kind of conversation. And I think what we'd like to do as part of our response to the climate emergency is act as a kind of means of enabling that kind of wider kind of conversation. I know conversations working with the council as well, with Kevin, is part of that story as well. Yeah, we, we, we certainly as a council want to have those conversations. We were reminded of that very clearly by the people who participated in the People's Jury. They said, we want to carry on being involved. So we have an online platform. We're going to have a meeting later, later in November. Do get in touch with me or get in touch with the council and, and say you want to be involved. Yeah, and I think one of the powerful contributions we had was around the importance of stories and narrative. And indeed, we've heard some quite personal kind of local stories as well around some of the challenges of this and a conversation beginning about how we might uh, respond to that. And I think we need to proliferate those kinds of stories in trying to address some of the challenges. And they are both an individual and they are structural. I think about organisations like the university, like the council. So I think thanks so much for coming tonight and, in, and engaging. Um, I think it's been a, a hopefully a very uh, interesting and productive evening for everybody. Thanks to the panel. And yes, Jocelyn for the music, I think.